There was a hidden game development issue we have yet to look at as regards variable frame rates. Up to this point, we've assumed that our game will be running at an optimal 60 frames per second. But what happens when hardware can't keep up to the processing demands of the game and a frame rate drop happens, perhaps dramatically to say half of what we'd expect, 30 frames per second? Well, we know that that means our update methods would run at half speed, only executing 30 cycles within that time frame. The effect this will have on our game, as it currently stands, would it would make the game appear to slow down to half speed. Everything would be slower, movement, lerping, counters, everything. And we can actually induce this frame rate drop in code in order to test this out and see what happens by coding it up. Let's, so let's go to the world manager. All right, so we'll just put this in start, start off with a comment. Set the target frame rate. And we do that by accessing the application class and then take the target frame rate property and that'll represent 60 frames per second. And for quality settings, you'll want to also set the vsync count to zero for this to work properly. So what we want to do is we want to run it at half speed, 30 frames per second. So let's see what effect that has in our game. Yeah, it's definitely not a good scenario to have that kind of change from what we're expecting. All right, now a lot of old school games worked exactly like this. They slowed down to a crawl and, you know, in some cases this effect was intentional. In other cases, it was tolerated, but in either case, it was considered okay because the hardware and software were tightly coupled to each other. The developers knew exactly how the hardware would respond because the game was designed with a particular hardware the game was running on in mind. Uh, an old console, uh, arcade circuit board, and so on. But today, even 2D games can run on an indeterminate number of, of platforms, all with varying hardware specs. So this slowdown effect can be unpredictable. And for that matter, running too fast can be a problem as well. It's probably an even bigger problem if the game runs at double the speed or more uh, when the frame rate is faster than you'd expect at 60 frames per second. So the challenge then becomes, how do you make the game run what's called frame rate independent? So that, that's to say, after a certain amount of real time has passed, how do we ensure that objects and variables will be at predictable and constant places and values relative to what you've come to expect. How do you make your game run as if it's running along in real time, even though that concept we know is an illusion. In the game world, everything is relative to how fast the update method runs, right? My analogy for how you'd imagine this is if you're filming video of a passing car, it doesn't matter if you're filming at 30 frames per second or 60 frames per second, you expect the car to be traveling at the same speed relative to the background when you play either video back. In the 30 frames per second video, the car will have to be farther ahead than the same numbered frame in the 60 frames per second video. This gives a clue as to how we need to think about simulating this natural appearance of space and time in a game world, making sure that an object, for example, is farther ahead at lower frames per second than it would otherwise be at a higher frames per second. But this also applies to things that aren't objects in our game world. Counters, for example, as we'll see in this lesson. So let's take the cube's movement as an example. Right now it's moving at 0.07 units on every frame. But how do we make it move twice that amount 0.14 on every frame if the frame rate gets cut in half. And more to the point, how do we make this a variable amount, considering that the frame rate will be variable, changing from one frame to the next? Well, we achieve this by using a really simple property in Unity called delta time, which simply returns the amount of real time it took to process the previous frame. You then use this value as a multiplier, typically, although not necessarily, but usually you multiply a relevant value by delta time to modify the game mechanics that you expect to change frame by frame. So what we could do is we can just, in the debug log, 
output delta time. So it's in the time. And it's now going to run at roughly 30 frames per second. So that should return a delta time value on each frame of roughly 0 0.033, something like that. So let's consider this for a second. If our game ran at 60 frames per second, it would take 0 0.0166 seconds to render the previous frame. You get this by dividing one second by 60 frames, right? And then if the frame rate drops to half, 30 frames per second, it would take double that amount of time to render the previous frame. So one divided by 30 is 0 0.033. We can then use this value as a multiplier to the speed field of the cube to make it move double the distance at half the frame rate, or any amount in between for that matter, as the multiplier will be you know, inversely analogous to the frame rate. Twice as slow means you need to go twice as far. Six times slower means you need to go six times farther, right? In order to have this appearance of real time. That's all handled perfectly with this delta time property. But right now, our existing cube's value is 0 0.07. And if it's multiplied by 0 0.0166, as we'd expect at 60 frames per second, it'll, be, it'll render a much too small of a value. So what we could do is simply increase the speed value of the cube by default to whatever it would have to be to yield 0 0.07 when multiplied by 0 0.0166. You get that by dividing 0 0.07 by 0 0.0166 which gives us 4.2. And then we'll multiply that speed value by time dot delta time, which gives us the modification we're looking for to make it frame rate independent. So simply multiply it by time dot delta time. And we'll have to do this for every reference to the speed field here. We can test this out. Yeah, it looks like our cube is going at the same speed as it was at 60 frames per second while you see the sphere is kind of lagging behind, right? So this does solve a problem, but we'd have to do this kind of, you know, figure out the right number for all of our existing values in order to make it frame rate independent. But I think this could be handled a lot better by creating a custom class that we can then apply to our existing values that we then have to have modified by delta time. So let's start by creating a class in our scripts world folder. But before that, let's just comment this out, get everything back to normal. And 0.07. All right, so yeah, create a, uh, a new C-sharp script. We'll call it timer. So what we'll do with this class is we'll have a static property return simply delta time times 60, which at 60 frames per second should be close to one, right? At 30 frames per second, it'll be close to two and so on. So we can then use this value as a multiplier that we're wanting to get this double at half speed and so forth kind of functionality. So we're not going to need this. It's also not going to be a mono behavior. It's just going to be a basic C sharp class. So we'll start off with public static float. We'll create a property called delta time mod as a modifier. And we'll just need a getter for that, which returns time dot delta time multiplied by 60. All right, simple. So now turning again to this speed field in the cube controller, we can then multiply it by this property in the movement method. Change this reference to timer dot delta time mod. We'll also apply that to these other places. Now in many of our scripts, we also have a lot of counters that increment or decrement by one on every frame. But 
these should also be frame rate independent, right? The game count should count at a relative time interval. So to fix this, we can change the counter, uh, our counters that we currently have to floats. And again, assuming the game is running at 60 frames per second, we'll expect this counter to return close to one on every frame, right? Running at 60 frames per second. So let's put this in a public field in the timer. All right, so say public float counter. And let's set the starting point for this in a constructor. So that would be what? Public timer. Let's say starting point. And simply make counter equal the starting point. There was passed in the constructor. And now just to take one example, our cool counter is no longer going to be an int. So let's make it of type timer instead. And we may as well change the name to something more descriptive. Okay, so say it's timer and call it teleport cool. Now we'll need to initialize it. Let's do that in the start. So say teleport cool equals new timer and starting point zero. And then we want to reference this timer's counter field where we previously had the cool counter. So with all these red squiggly lines, let's replace these. So teleport cool dot counter now is what we'll be using. And well, we can replace this part right here. So let's just create a simple method that just decrements the counter until it reaches zero. So in the timer, let's create a method for this public void run reverse. We'll say counter equals, we'll do a little ternary here. If counter is greater than zero. Counter minus equals delta time mod. Else make sure that it's bottoms out at zero, right? And here, we just get rid of all this, make the counter run in reverse. So just access that method right there. We also need to change the name for cool counter in the HUD, which references this field. So go to the heads up display, and now it'll be teleport cool dot counter dot two string, right? But see, there's a problem now. The counter outputs with the decimal place, right? But we want a whole number to display and yet keep the counter itself afloat. So to fix this, we can simply cast to an int and that'll truncate the decimals, but that'll look a bit messy. So let's instead use a helpful rounding method for this, sort of wrap it around this part. So let's say math f dot round to int and we'll want to wrap it around all the way up to the counter part, right? right? Because this is a timer and that's a float. And after that float is returned, we're going to pass it into this, round it to an int. And then once it's an int, then once it's an int, we'll two string it, right? That's why it looks kind of like that, which may look funny. All right, so now let's go through each script in order and see what needs to be changed. All right here in cube animate, we see alert method, you know, and lerps change in every frame. So we know we'll have to employ delta time. So we do so typically by multiplying the rate or percentage argument. That would be this one right here. So just multiply that by timer dot delta time mod. And now in The rotation speed is going to be uh, 
it's going to vary on each frame. So let's just say multiply that by delta time mod. We'll have a bunch of changes here in the sphere controller. So where do we start? Okay, well, let's start with this. We know that close call is going to be plus equaled on each frame. So that has to be frame rate independent. I think we can just get away with making that a float and let's say timer cool crowd and now let's call this to make it make more sense spawn timer and well let's just group these together for no particular reason I feel like they belong together And this will be spawn timer now equals new timer starts at zero. And this will be a new timer that starts at 220, right? And again, just for no particular reason, I'm going to group them together. Oh, never made that timer, all right? All right, we'll apply these all in a moment, but let's keep going here. So here in the move towards, we have a similar speed field for the sphere controller as we do the uh, the sphere as we do the cube. So let's just make that multiply by our delta time mod. And here we have this lerp, so same thing. Now for the cool crowd and spawn timer timers, uh, one runs forward to a certain point, then it resets to zero, while the other runs backwards from a point and resets to its starting point. So let's add methods for this functionality in the timer. So say public void run forward to and pass in a float, we'll call it limit. And similar ternary as before, we'll say counter equals if counter is less than limit, counter plus equals delta time mod else equals zero. And public void run reverse from, and we'll say, if, excuse me, and we'll call this reset to and we'll use this ternary if counter is greater than zero counter minus equals delta time mod else we reset to whatever value we predetermine it should reset to or actually we assign uh, when we call the method. So in the sphere controller spawn enemy method, we'll just say spawn timer dot counter and get rid of this. because so we have a functionality built into the method that we just made spawn timer dot run forward to and we'll want to run to the spawn spawn interval right goes every 500 ticks then recess to zero and here in the crowd shear we have the cool crowd reference so if now this will, it's a timer now, so we'll have the counter field. So change all these references. 
can get rid of this and just say cool crowd dot run reverse from max cool time. And remember our point totals change in every frame, so we should also multiply our delta time mod to close call, which became the float just recently. So we'll do that here, wave count times timer dot, dot delta time mod. All right, some of these changes have an effect on our world managers, so let's head over there, make the necessary changes. Actually, we'll completely change this here. We'll do this differently. Let's start by making a timer for this class here. So, say timer, horn timer. We'll sign we'll say new timer starting point of zero and the pre-spawn air horn we'll say float horn interval like a local float equals sphere script dot spawn interval minus 150 and now let's access our horn timer from this class so say if horn timer uh, counter is greater than horn interval just cleans this up a little bit and here we'll just run just run the horn timer. The run forward to method to the horn interval. All right. And we're going to want a conditional here. We'll say if sphere script dot spawn timer dot counter is equivalent to zero then we'll actually reset the horn timer counter just so this all syncs up properly and we'll also need to modify the get close call score so we now have to treat the temp total as a float as it adds up all of the close call scores which are now calculated in the sphere controller as floats Make this local variable a float and just cast that back to an int after the calculation's been made, right? We don't really care about it being a float when we're displaying it. And what else do we have here? We have we have a lerp in the music modifier, right? So what are we what are we doing with lerps? We're just Multiplying it by timer dot delta time mod. So same thing. So moving on in the game over manager, what do we have here? We need to add delta time to the lerp. So let's where's the new color here? Actually I just noticed this. Remember this is a represents a percentage, so 1 is 100% of the the way to 255, so it's not necessary to say 255. 1 represents 100% of the way. Anyways, that was just a little thing to fix, so we came here for this, adding delta time mod, and moving on to now the game start manager, we can make loop timer a timer, right? Well, We'll also need to make his backing field a timer. Here in the getter, we'll say, just take this out and say, take the backing field and run the run forward to method on it. And in start, that's no longer a valid set. Let's we'll say new timer and starting point zero. And here will be loop timer 
Well, no harm in just saying equivalent to zero. That'll get us the same functionality that we had before. And where should we go next? Well, zoom cam. We have a couple methods that lerp. So let's make the necessary changes for these. And actually, I think it'll be a lot easier now if we completely change the low pass filter method and use, use a lerp instead as follows. So never actually needed these. Let me just take this out. That was not necessary. I'm actually gonna comment this out, but before I do that, I can just make it a little bit smaller and more compact. I'll comment it out just so to preserve it so that you saw how we did it before. And now we just say frequency equals math f dot lerp. We'll pass in the frequency and limit and then the rate times timer dot delta time mod. And the camera lerp we just add the delta time mod. And of course, in late update, we'll have to reference these changes. So these calls to those methods that we just changed now, well, in particular, the low pass filter method We'll change it like this, we'll get rid of, we no longer even need. This has no longer any meaning in our method. All right, now moving right along, let's make these following changes to the power-up controller. To make this make more sense, let's, uh, this is also a counter, we'll make it a timer and call it kill timer, because that's what it does, it basically kills the power-up after a certain amount of time has been reached. And in start, we'll say kill timer equals well, it never had to be one, so let's just say new timer starts at zero. And we'll no longer need this, so remove that. And here we'll just say if kill timer dot counter, we'll just say if it's equivalent to 140, right? And we'll again use the run forward to 140, we'll pass in for that method. What else do we have here? We have right here, it should be good for the power controller. So moving now to the power manager, we have a spawn timer for the power manager. So let's just say private, Timer. Let's call it spawn timer now. Give it more meaning. And this can also be a timer. The meter for a power up. So here we'll say spawn timer. New timer. And again, it doesn't have to start at one, start at zero. And power meter, new timer, starting point of 50. 
And here what we can do is we can say now if spawn timer dot counter is greater than a counter is greater than 300. We'll have to change it here too. And what we'll do here, we'll say well, dot counter for the power meter. What are we doing? We're decrementing here. So what method do you think would work well here? Power up meter dot run dot run reverse, right? put that in there and we can get rid of this as well for the spawn timer and just say spawn timer dot run forward to 300 and it resets back to zero to create that functionality we had before so in the scripts that reference the power meter as an int we need to change these references accordingly so now in the power up controller we have here power up meter referenced. And the world manager, and the bonus announce, we had a reference here as well. Well, we can just take this all out now. Let's just do it this way. Power up manager dot power up meter dot counter times equals one point five F and here we'll say power manager dot power up meter dot counter times equals one point two five F. All right, and of course, in the heads-up display, we're referencing this. So again, we'll use that mathf.roundint, this time for the power meter. Right, so a lot of little changes, but at this point, I think this is all the stuff that we needed to make it frame rate independent. Uh, if we missed anything, I'll try to catch it in the next lesson, which will be all about tying up loose ends and sort of completing our, our game project before we build it for the final build. All right, so thanks a lot. I'll see you in the next video.